There are big companies being hit by SQL injections all the time, still in 2016. And if you mess it up, then all your usernames and passwords are out there in, on Pastebin or what have you, and it's, it's, it's bad PR, not to mention illegal, uh, you know, Data Protection Act and so on, and it's, yeah, it's bad news for everyone involved. And inevitably bad news for the hacker as well, who probably goes to jail. Okay, so I should just preface this by saying that, you know, if you do this, you will go to jail, so really don't, you know. Um, I'm doing it on my own website, which is allowed because I've given myself permission. I sometimes go back and watch older computer file videos because, you know, maybe I came to computer file a bit later because, uh, I, I don't know, maybe I was busy doing something. I don't know. But the reason is, so I go back and I look at these videos and uh, Tom Scott did a really interesting video on SQL injections, which is exactly right. Okay, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel by talking about exactly how they work. But what I thought is I'd do some and perhaps demonstrate to anyone who's got an interest in web development just how bad it is if you mess this up. This little pretend shop I can search for products. Anyone who actually does web development or any kind of design will see immediately this is, this is bad. Okay, we've got a lovely little blue gradient here and, a, and a, just a box. Okay, so I can search for hammer. Okay, and when I do that, I get a couple of hammers up. So I get a claw hammer and a sledgehammer. Right? And I can search for other things. Nails, is it? I don't know. I can't remember what I'm selling in this hardware shop. Uh, yeah, okay, so different kinds of nails. Right? These are all the nails that I know that exist. Right, different, different arbitrary lengths of nail, I assume they sell those. Anyway, right, this is not a shop that you would actually want to put your credit card details in. This shop also, apart from being bad as a shop, is also bad as a web program because it's PHP and I haven't escaped strings like I should have done. When I type in hammer and click submit, a post request goes off, PHP receives this and constructs an SQL query that says, you know, give me any rows that have hammer in and then asks the database for all those rows and then spits them out on the screen. Problem arises is if we put in a special SQL command character in this text box, then the string that PHP forms is gonna be malformed in some way. It's not gonna make any sense as a query anymore or it's gonna make sense as two queries or so on. And that's bad news for everyone involved. The first thing we do is we, we work out whether this text box is vulnerable at all, okay? So you just put a single quote in, right? And we press submit and it says, server error, we apologize for the inconvenience. Okay, well, it's very nice of them, but this is, that's bad news, right? We're in. A proper server would say there is no product with name single quote because there isn't. Or it would return any products like by O'Reilly's, you know, hammers, you know, that, that have an actual single quote in. It should have used that single quote as a character, not as a control structure. So what can we do to attack this? Well, the first thing we need to do is think a little bit about what the query might be behind the scenes so we can, we can adjust it. So I've got my, um, my text editor here and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to type in a query. So I'm thinking that the query is going to be something along the lines of select something, right, some question mark from some table. I don't know what the name of it is. I mean, it could be products or prod or, you know, IDs. I don't, you know, it could be anything. From some table where some column is like hammer. If I search for AMME, which is the middle characters of Hammer, I also see that it finds the Hammer, which means that it's putting wildcards in either side. So that's what my query is. Select something from some table where something is like Hammer. I have control over this bit, this Hammer word. Okay? I can't change the rest of the query because that's back-end PHP code. It's already been coded. So where are you typing this now? This is just a text editor. I'm just doing this so in my own head I can visualize the query, right? You wouldn't necessarily have to do this if you were super good at this, right? Um, but it, it helps and also it's obviously illustrative to people who are watching. Also, this does SQL markup, syntax highlighting, so I can show you how the query changes as I change it. So, this is my generic query, right? How do I edit it? Well, what happens if I, if I just put in a single quote? So I'm gonna copy this line. If I put in a single quote instead of hammer, that's what happens. Now you can see those two percents are different colors. And the reason is because what's happened is this first percent is inside a proper string. And now this second percent sitting on its own outside of any SQL string. And that's gonna cause a server error. So that's just that text editor showing you by the color coding that... Yeah, this is showing me pretty much what will be going on in PHP when I type single quote into that, into that box, which is that basically it breaks SQL because it sends a malformed query. Okay, that's not a valid query. The server will respond, the database will respond with an error and PHP will say server error, sorry for the inconvenience. So the question then becomes, what do I change this single quote into to really get information out of this? And the first thing that's important to do is find out what database management system is running this on the server. So imagine that SQL is a language that's shared by a bunch of different database management systems. So SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, 
and so on and so forth. They will all have very similar syntax, slightly different, but very similar. Certainly select will be the same. And the point is that if I know which one it is, I can then start targeting that one directly. And for example, find out where their list of table names are. And finding the list of table names, obviously quite helpful for me to get rid of some of these question marks and fill in some blanks. First of all, I can get rid of the rest of this malform query by putting in a end of command and a comment, okay? And you'll see in the syntax that it's gone gray, which tells me that now this is the query that I'm typing in. So if my input to this shop is single quote, then a semicolon and a comment, then what should happen is it should change to this query here, which is select something from the table where wildcard, which means everything. So I should get all of the products in the database, which I do. Okay, so this is all the products. It's not a very good shop. That two dozen? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> no one wants these products. No one's buying my things. Right, so, so that's a start. Now, what do we put in as well um, to try and break this? So the first thing we can do is we can put in something that will only work if MySQL is the database management system. Now, I could also do an equivalent for Postgres or equivalent for SQL Server. I happen to know secretly that this is MySQL, but you could automate this pretty quickly. So what I'm going to say is select something from something from where something like this thing, okay? And I'm going to put in hammer because I, I only want to return the two items, okay? That'll make sense in a minute. We're hammer and one equals sleep two. So what I'm saying there is find any products that are called hammer and also where the function sleep two, sleep for two seconds, wait for two seconds, returns a one. So that should still return two hammers, but it should take four seconds to do so because there's two hammers, right? That's my hypothesis. Let's see if it works. So I'm going to copy exactly from hammer all the way to the end of my quote there. And I'm going to paste that in and we're going to see. And it's thinking, it's thinking, and it's taken four seconds. It's not found any uh, products, which probably means sleep return a zero, not a one. So there's my bad, right? It doesn't really matter. The point is it waited exactly four seconds and then returned us either some products or not some products. So that was basically you just trying a command just to see if it did what you asked it to. Yeah, so in, in, inside this query, I've buried the request for the server to sleep for two seconds. There's two hammers, which basically means for every row that it finds, it's also gonna wait two seconds, which is two, okay, four seconds. Now, MySQL has a sleep function in it. Capital letters sleep brackets the number of seconds you want to sleep for. Um, it's wait for delay in SQL Server. So it, I would adjust this slightly and I'd try it again. So if it didn't sleep, I'd think, well, it's probably not SQL, MySQL. Maybe I'll try the equivalent for Postgres or I'll try the equivalent. There are what we call blind SQL injections where even if we're not getting any output, we can, based on just the time it takes to respond, work out what's going on. You could do another thing where you said select from a certain table name and also sleep. And if it comes back slowly, you know there's a table with that name. Okay? So you can, even if there's no output, use this blind technique to work out what's going on. Okay? It's going to take you a little while to do. Right? In my case, I happened to get it the first time, yay. Okay? So good news. Right? So now what can we do? So let's start with my hammer thing again. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to copy it. Okay, next up, we're going to use the fact that we know it's MySQL to try and find some more information on what tables exist and so on. This isn't a blind SQL injection because if I search for hammer, it produces me a table. So it's actually outputting to the screen. Now this is very common. A shop, you search for a product, it's got to take that table information and turn it into an HTML format for you to look at. Okay? So even if it doesn't look like an actual table, like on my bad website, it, it is in the sense that it's taken table data and turned it into some form. So it will have then also downloaded a picture of the product, you know, some reviews. I'll get rid of this bit, this sleep, and I'll say, what can I do that sticks information I'd like to extract from a database on the end of this product? So what I really want to do is turn this table into a table that dumps out, you know, passwords or something like that, if such things exist in this database. Now, in SQL, we use the union keyword to do this. Okay, so union basically takes two tables with the same amount of columns and sticks them one on top of the other. So if I can find a way of sticking some personal private database information on the bottom of the camera list, then it's going to output it to the screen. So select something from some table. Now, all we know about this, this select, is that it's selecting three columns, okay? Because there's three columns output. At least that's what I'm hypothesizing. So select three columns from some table where some column name is like hammer. Okay, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say like hammer, union, subquery, select one, two, three from dual. 
Now, for those of you who don't know MySQL particularly, Joule is essentially a placeholder table name to select from if you don't really have a table to select from. Okay? It's used for testing purposes mostly. Okay? So I'm literally selecting the numbers 1, 2, and 3 in three columns from some hypothetical Joule table. Right? Now, if this works, what it will do is stick 1, 2, 3 on a row on the bottom of my hammers, if it works. Okay? So let's see. So we'll take my hammer, I copy all the way to the end. There we go. And I go into my website and I search. And there's my one, two, three. Okay, that's bad news for the inventor of this website, which coincidentally is me. Okay, so the fact that I can output queries to the screen is really bad. It's not just bad; it's catastrophic. Okay, because we're only a few steps away from full-on users and passwords. So let's do it. So, um, you know, not to be too cavalier about the security. Right. So let's not select one, two, and three from Jewel because maybe that's not. Um, very informative. Okay, let's select from MySQL's information schema. So there's a table in the information schema called, funnily enough, information schema.tables, and that will tell us all the table information, names of tables, what columns they have, and so on. This is the table of tables. Table of table tables. Right. Let's union select table name, table schema, which is the database name, and then a three because we need to make sure the number of columns match up between our union table and the original hammer table. Does it just put it underneath it? Literally then? just puts it underneath, yeah. If you want to merge columns sort of in a row by row, that's a join. And if you're just sticking them on top of each other, that's, that's an appending, that's a, a union. Just, just two different terms for SQL. So select table name, table schema three from information schema dot tables. Notice it's got purple, which is a good sign because it means that this syntax highlighting recognises I've actually typed in an SQL command. So let's copy this in a slow way with my fingers. There we go. And paste that in there. There we go. So the information scheme is essentially a metadata table that holds information on all the columns and tables and number of rows and things for all the tables. You would query if you want to know what columns exist and what tables exist. I've got a claw hammer and I've got a sledgehammer. I've got a funny blog table called evil and a funny blog table called posts, which we may talk about in a different video, right? I haven't bothered to put them in different databases, that's what's happened there, right? Then we have a bunch of kind of almost semi-random tables. This is MySQL stuff. We scroll down and then right at the bottom, we've got the shop tables and we've got a table called stock and a table called users. So we won't select anything from stock because that doesn't seem very interesting, particularly as we can search for anyway. But the users table on the other hand might seem quite useful to us. Okay, We don't know what's in there, but we've got to assume some kind of user data. Now, if we go back to my SQL query, we know what the table is. What we don't know is what the columns are in the table. And if we want to put some output from that users table on the bottom of our table, we're going to need to know what the column names are, because otherwise we can't select them. We can't just say select everything, because there'll probably be more than three columns, and that won't union properly. So we're going to say select something like hammer, union, Select column name, two, three, from information schema. Yeah, I'm off the screen now. Let's keep scrolling. Information schema dot uh, columns, where table name. So the information schema dot columns table, unsurprisingly, has column information. It also has what table that column belongs to, where table name equals users. OK, well, I thought about that. There we go. OK, that looks good to me. So let's copy that. Let's see if it works. There we go. OK, so what we've got is we've got our hammers again. Right? We're going to keep seeing them. And then we've got a couple of standard MySQL things like current connections, how many people are logged in. And then we've got some actual column names, user ID, user login, user hash, user type. Now, anyone that knows anything about hashing passwords and so on no, can guess that the ID is probably just for a number representing that user, probably just stuck in the table by default. The login is going to be their login name, and hash is going to be a hashed version of their password. Okay? Now, most database cracks don't get unencrypted passwords. People are slowly at least wising up a little bit to hashing, although they don't tend to hash them particularly securely. So this is, this is certainly a candidate for uh, crack, password cracking, for example. So let's get those things out. So we need three columns from the users table, and we want all of it. Right? So we want, let's say, user login, user hash, and user type. So let's get rid of this select. Here we go. And we're gonna, so we're still unioning. That's a, I don't know if that's an actual verb. Uh, we're still performing a union. Select U name. Is it U name? Or is it U login? U login. Okay, so U, U login, U hash, U type from 
users, and that's all. Three columns, append it to the previous one. Okay, so we'll copy that and see if it works. And it does. So we've got a bunch of users, they're hashed passwords, and we also see that because of a type, this guy's an admin. Okay, so I would focus on his password personally, right? So that's pretty scary. Okay, it didn't take me very many queries to get through this. Now, um, before everyone goes off and cracks these passwords, right, which you're welcome to do if you want, but bear in mind this is a website that only runs on my computer and these are probably just the word password or something like that because I wasn't being particularly careful when I created this database. These aren't real people whose passwords you're cracking here, so don't waste your time, would be my advice. It's scary how easy that, how easy that was to do. Now, Tom talks a lot about how you stop this kind of stuff from happening, okay, parameterized queries, sanitizing your input so that I can't put single quotes in without them being escaped. Okay? Those sort of things are important. But you have to also think about things like second order SQL injections, which is where I put something into an SQL server and then it gets used internally as a query. So for example, I might make my username a SQL injection, right? And it gets escaped properly, but it gets stored in the database. And then when I go to change my password, the injection gets run. Okay, so that's a second order injection. So there's loads of complicated stuff you can do that could get around some of these things. So if you're a web developer, you have to pay a lot of attention to this because you don't want your users' hashed passwords and email address combinations stuck on the net because it's embarrassing and illegal and really bad news for your customers. Um, I mean, case in point, TalkTalk Talk got hacked a few months ago and that was hacked by essentially a script, a Python script that performs what I just did, but in bulk really, really quickly. It takes, I've run it, it takes about, on my website, three commands to obtain what I just obtained um, and dump them to a file, which is pretty terrifying, uh, you know. So I would suggest people start sanitizing their inputs pretty quick. The problem is that if I obtain a cookie off you, which is supposed to be secure, then I can send that to, let's say, Amazon or to a shop and say, I'm Sean, please, you know, what's in his shopping basket? What's his address? What's his credit card details? 